Full range of motion versus lengthened partials. Does the current evidence live up to the social media hype? When designing a resistance training program to maximize muscle growth, it's widely believed that the trainee or the coach should carefully consider the appropriate manipulations of a wide range of training variables, such as weekly set volume, training frequency, and proximity to failure many of which I've discussed in great detail on my previous YouTube videos. One training variable that's taken the fitness industry by storm of late is range of motion, which is typically defined as the degree of movement that occurs at a specific joint while performing a specific exercise. The literature has discussed full range of motion exercise as performing a movement pattern without any restrictions, which basically means performing the exercise through its full concentric phase and eccentric phase. On the contrary, performing exercise with any degree of restriction or limitation has been broadly categorized as partial range of motion. Partial range of motion exercise may be further subdivided into training either at longer muscle lengths or shorter muscle lengths. So to put some context into this, broadly speaking, performing a bicep preacher curl from zero degrees where the elbow is completely extended to around 130 degrees where it's completely flexed or in the muscle shortened position would be considered full range of motion. Now, throughout this entire range of motion, we can break off the exercise into emphasizing either the lengthened position, longer muscle lengths, or the shortened position, so shorter muscle lengths. The most lengthened portion of the exercise emphasizing longer muscle lengths in the research setting would be the initial portion of the full range of motion. And this lies between zero degrees and 50 degrees. However, performing the same exercise from 80 degrees through to 130 degrees, otherwise known as the final portion of the full range of motion, would be considered the most shortened position of the exercise, emphasizing shorter muscle lengths. In the context of maximizing muscle growth, past review papers on the topic have suggested a benefit of performing full range of motion exercise over partial range of motion exercise. You can find some of these studies linked in the description for this video. Also guys, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more evidence-based content just like this. All right, let's get back into it. However, more recent papers on this topic have suggested that the superiority of performing full range of motion versus partial range of motion may be dependent on the exact point of the partial range of motion of the exercise being performed. Basically, they suggest that when an exercise is being performed at shorter muscle lengths, it is inferior to full range of motion, and that partial range of motion performed at longer muscle lengths may actually be superior to full range of motion exercise. So evidence for this statement brought by a recent meta-analysis conducted by Wolf and colleagues, who suggested that performing partial range of motion exercise at longer muscle lengths may actually provide hypertrophic benefits when compared to full range of motion exercise. Since the publication of this study, the notion that full range of motion exercise is inferior for muscle growth has spread across the fitness industry and has been posted on dozens of social media accounts, podcasts, and YouTube videos. Since these talking points carry a great deal of weight and may have larger ramifications when it comes to exercise prescription, I believe it is important to discuss the data behind the analysis carried out by Wolf and colleagues. The sub-analysis comparing full range of motion exercise to partial range of motion at the longer muscle lengths included a total of three studies which are listed in the description below. First of all, while there are likely other meta-analyses conducted with the same or even fewer studies, in my opinion, this is still a rather small pool of evidence to be able to definitively draw Draw conclusions from. Nevertheless, of these three studies, two were conducted in resistance trained individuals and one was conducted in untrained individuals. So from here on in, I will discuss each study briefly and at the end, I'll provide a summary and my practical takeaways from the available data. So the first study included in the sub-analysis was conducted by Godot and colleagues in 2019. The authors of this investigation employed an eight-week resistance training program focusing specifically on the triceps. Using a randomized design, the participants were placed in either a full range of motion training program or a partial range of motion training program using the lying barbell tricep extension as the chosen exercise. The partial range of motion group performed the same exercise, however this group started at an elbow angle of 45 degrees and ended with an elbow angle of 90 degrees. Both groups trained at three times per week for eight weeks and performed three sets of an eight to 12 rep max for their respective range of motions at each session. At the end of the intervention, the authors compared muscle growth adaptations for the triceps. The authors observed considerably more tricep growth in the partial range of motion group than the full range of motion group, with increases of approximately 49% and 28% in the triceps, respectively. Now, these findings certainly lend credit to the suggestion that partial range of motion exercise at longer muscle lengths is superior for muscle growth, 
However, there are several limitations within this study that may caution such interpretation. So, independent of the unusually large changes observed, and just for reference, six to eight percent is what's typically observed for muscle growth, the actual degrees of range of motion performed by the partial range of motion group was described by the authors of the original paper as being exclusively in the mid portion of the range of motion. And this would in fact emphasize moderate to short muscle lengths and not necessarily longer muscle lengths per se. Meaning there is an argument to be had as to whether or not this study should have been included in the sub-analysis conducted by Wolf and colleagues. Additionally, it also has to be noted that the measures of muscle cross-sectional area were estimations made by the authors using measures of muscle thickness and arm circumference. And as a consequence, this may have led to far more variability or error in the measurements observed. Now, had the authors included a time-matched non-exercise control group, this would have aided in interpreting the noise of the measurements a little better. And finally, the authors only measured triceps at one portion along the length of the upper arm, the 60% site. Being that muscle is suggested to grow non-homogeneously across the muscle belly, it would have been interesting to see the differences in muscle growth response between both groups across additional muscle sites taken more proximal and distally. The second study included in the sub-analysis was conducted by Walk, Horsen and colleagues in 2021. This study used a within-participant design, meaning that participants had each leg randomly assigned to a different training condition, one performing full range of motion and the other performing partial range of motion at longer muscle lengths. The exercise and muscle group being targeted were the 45-degree leg press machine and the vastus lateralis. For this specific exercise, full range of motion was performed with a starting knee angle of 90 degrees and ending with a knee angle of zero degrees or full knee extension. While the partial range of motion at longer muscle lengths was performed at a starting knee angle of 90 degrees and ended with a knee angle of 81 degrees. Interestingly, the authors of this study employed an explosive resistance training program where the participants only performed the concentric portion of the repetitions and were instructed to perform each rep as fast and as forcibly as possible. Training was carried out three times per week for 10 weeks and the sessions consisted of three to six working sets of a four to eight rep max, depending on the day. Following the intervention, the authors observed no changes in muscle thickness of the vastus lateralis, independent of the range of motion utilized during training. This means neither condition, whether it be full range of motion or partial range of motion at longer muscle lengths, grew following the 10 weeks of training. Now, within any study, there are several limitations that must be considered. First of all, it is perhaps the case that this interesting combination of explosive style training, which focused on muscular power, combined with long rest times between repetitions, which was about three seconds between reps, and the lower rep ranges simply provided an inadequate stimulus for muscle growth adaptations to begin with. Secondly, the authors only measured muscle thickness at one site along the length of the vastus lateralis, so again at the 60% site. So it is unknown whether muscle growth may have occurred at other muscle regions, or in fact, if other muscles of the quadriceps, such as the vastus medialis or the vastus intermedius, saw some growth. Now, the final study included in the sub-analysis was conducted by Pedroza and colleagues in 2022. The study randomly assigned a cohort of 45 untrained women into one of five groups. Now, for the purposes of today's video, I will only talk about the two groups of five that are actually relevant to this topic, those being full range of motion and partial range of motion at longer muscle lengths. The authors employed a 12-week intervention focusing specifically on muscle growth of the rectus femoris and the vastus lateralis. Participants of this study performed a bilateral knee extension machine exercise with either full range of motion or partial range of motion at longer muscle lengths. Participants performed, depending on the day of the week, three to six working sessions sets of seven reps at 60% of their one rep max for each respective range of motion. Following the 12 weeks of training, the authors observed greater muscle growth in the rectus femoris in the partial range of motion groups at longer muscle lengths compared to the full range of motion group. Meaning this study observed that training exclusively at longer muscle lengths was better for rectus femoris muscle growth, but not necessarily for vastus lateralis muscle growth when compared to performing full range of motion. Now, one major limitation of this study Study, however, was the prescription of sub-maximal training protocols, where the exercise prescription consisted of sets of only seven repetitions at 60% of their one rep max. Now, it is well known within the resistance training literature that proximity to failure is an extremely important consideration when designing hypertrophy training protocols. 
And with that said, there is a ton of data in the isometric literature to suggest that performing exercise at long muscle lengths is far more fatiguing than short muscle lengths when exercise is matched for volume. So with this in mind, it is possible that performing the knee extension or leg extension exercise exclusively at longer muscle lengths could have provided a more fatiguing stimulus than the full range of motion. And this may have allowed the subjects in the lengthened muscle position group to perform the exercise slightly closer to failure, which ultimately would favor a muscle growth response in the longer muscle lengths group. Now, although this is me just speculating, it's reasonable to question whether such differences would still exist if the protocols were prescribed to failure. So to summarize these findings, we have one study that was actually performed at partial range of motion, which was arguably moderate to short muscle lengths, and one study that showed a slight benefit in favor of the muscle lengthened partial group. Now, with this in mind, it would appear that the statement suggesting the superiority of one range of motion over the other is not well supported by the data included in the analysis of Wolf and colleagues. I'm not personally ruling anything out just yet, but it is my opinion that much more robust research is necessary that directly compares the two ranges of motion across various exercises and muscle groups before any consensus is reached in terms of the optimal range of motion for maximizing muscle growth adaptations. Thank you so much for watching this video guys and please don't forget to like this video if you found it helpful, subscribe to my channel and take a look at the description below for where you can learn more about what we've talked about today along with all my other products and services. I'll see you in my next video.